What's up, Sigma Males? This is Alex from Sigma Spirit. Today we're going to talk a little bit about historical men and how they were hated, these characters were disliked, and yet they were admired and respected for the things they contributed to the world as we know it today. And now they're famous, but they made a lot of enemies. And I want to, I want to wrap that up with how they were Sigma in many aspects connected to this Sigma male personality type. So before I get into that, if you like this kind of historical reach and looking back into the past, making sense of the world today by looking back, go ahead and like this video because it helps these videos spread, these ideas spread. It's very complicated times. Lots of messages are coming into your mind. We're certainly being programmed for something in the world today. And with every like this kind of video gets, the more it can spread and we can program good knowledge and ancient wisdom into the world instead of the garbage that modern culture is giving us. So let's look at this kind of character in the world, this ancient historic figure who was hated and they were looked at like an enemy by many people, and yet they were respected, they were loved as history progressed and people could understand the accomplishments and the things that they gave the world. And how is that different today? How is that different from what happens in the world today? Well, the modern man is afraid to be disliked. And yes, it's a little different now because we live in a world with mainstream society, the mainstream media. We've got this mainstream media engine and it's very scary to think about ourselves one day being on TV as maybe the, the most hated man in the world. Look at someone like Edward Snowden or various people who do things knowing full well that they're going to be considered public enemy number one. And without getting into whether what he did was right or wrong, think about the courage that takes to do. <clears throat> the modern man is afraid to get reprimanded at work for his principles, let alone to sacrifice everything. And what's happened because of that? Well, we're seeing that integrity is just disappearing. There's no sense of honor. There's no sense of decency anymore in the world. It's fading, that's for sure. And it seems we're all on this path because we want to be liked. And one of the most powerful things recently is this idea in myself I've discovered is that I don't really want to be liked and I'm okay with it. As long as I say the message that is true in my heart, I'm okay with not being liked. I know it'll reach a certain people who will respect this message and they will know that I'm speaking from truth from my heart and it doesn't really matter. If I one day get roasted on national television if one day you see me sitting in the chair on Good Morning America apologizing, so be it. But I'm going to do so with my head held high, and I'm going to do so knowing that actually I didn't really want to be liked. In another video, I talk about Rick, and Rick Sanchez from Rick and Morty talking about how people's booze didn't matter to him because he knows what makes them cheer. <clears throat> and when I think about being liked, you think about all these people liking you. You don't really like them, so who cares if they like you? Most people in the world, while we share a lot of humanity and there's a base level of respect and love, there's a certain truth to knowing that you don't really care about everyone's opinion, and you shouldn't. It's very harmful. But most people in the world are out there trying to garner the respect and the ad adoration, the admiration, the likes, the thumbs up from the majority of the world. And I find that that's very dangerous and that these people in the past didn't really do things for that reason. And now with social media, we have sort of this behaviors ingrained in us. We're being programmed for this behavior. We have an actual symbol of being liked instead of working from a place of principle integrity. Now, thumbs up matter, followers matter. How much money you make from a channel 
or business matters instead of your truth, your principles, your integrity, all that deep stuff. So in the past, there were these people that truly embodied the I don't give a damn attitude. They were renegades. They had strong polarizing beliefs and they weren't afraid to just stand behind them because they knew in their hearts they were the truth. They were abstract, they were eccentric, and they were driven. They were driven to create these things for the world, <clears throat> explore these concepts, walk a path of mastery in order to accomplish something. And they were also selfish and independent. So I wanna explore five examples of this kind of person. And I wanna just do a quick dive. I don't wanna to go too deep because I wanna let you formulate your own opinion with one of these. I want you to go deep on one of these. If one of these sounds interesting, there are many interesting books, videos about these people. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about each of them and then I'm gonna say why they were Sigma and also why they were hated and why it was important that they ignored the hate, why they didn't focus on being liked and they just went all in on the concept, on the idea that they believe to be true. So the first example we have Richard Burton, Sir Richard Burton. Many years later, he became a Sir after people recognized what he did was actually very important for England. He was an explorer. He was a 19th century everyman. He was a true Renaissance man. He was a spy. He was a linguist. He was an explorer, a poet, a diplomat, a fencer, a soldier, so on and so on, so forth. He was a cartographer. He made maps, all these various things. And one thing I really liked was this idea of him going to Mecca. And he was one of the first foreigners to go to Mecca, Mecca, if not the first. And this was during a time not when you could just book a flight to the Middle East. But this was a time when foreigners weren't allowed into Mecca. This is a time when aliens with white skin could be killed for being in Mecca. So it took a lot of balls for him to go into this place. And he did so as a social chameleon. He dyed his skin. He learned the language. He, he embodied this character so that he could fit in as this Muslim man in Mecca. And I find that to be just crazy cool. He was a chameleon. He was an observer of people. He watched the world. He took it all in and he wrote about it. He wrote about his discoveries. He just wanted to absorb the world and take it all in. And he also liked certain things. He liked taboo things. He was the person who brought the Kama Sutra to the Victorian age England, the West, the sort of restricted West. So he was a bit of a sexual explorer, although at the time he was called a deviant. He was called taboo. He was called heretical. He spent time with ladyboys in India. He spent time in brothels. He was most probably bisexual. So during that time, he was very controversial. And for him to be rep representing England as a diplomat was even more controversial. People didn't like him. And as his legend grew, as an explorer, his legend grew, people didn't like him. People feared him. And many people feared him for, for what he was capable of doing. There were these stories about him and people didn't like that. He was definitely someone from another world. He was a Sigma spirit because he was adventurous. He was self-reliant. He was so capable. He could do anything by himself. He went on to the Nile. He did various explorations, adventures by himself. And he just threw these things together and said, I'm going here and I'm going to do them. And he was introverted. He was very much to himself though. He wasn't like the, the broad chested alpha male, come on, we're doing it. Someone like Teddy Roosevelt, you might imagine, much more alpha. This guy was quiet, he was brooding. He was independent and he was very intelligent. So the next person I think of is Socrates, the philosopher. And he was a Greek philosopher and he's considered to be the father of Western philosophy. But he was not always liked. He's a controversial figure. He was a critic of democracy and he was, a, he was an antagonist. 
Plato called him a gadfly. He was this person that kind of circulated and, and struck down and was always antagonizing and criticizing certain, certain things during a time when democracy was blossoming. He was critical of it. And he made many enemies because of this. And he started to impact the youth. He started to talk to younger people and start to influence their ideas about Greece and the world, philosophy, politics. <clears throat> and many people at this time were writing a lot. So not much is known about Socrates because he considered writing to be inferior to dialogue. And this was a time when writing was everything. So imagine sort of the opposite of now. Um, in a time of extroversion now, everybody, everybody's outward. We just want to have these conversations. Writing's kind of becoming a lost art form in many ways. So this was very controversial back then. That wasn't his only belief that was against the grain. And he held a lot of these beliefs in court and in the political spectrum. And he made a lot of enemies. He was very stubborn. And eventually he's accused of corrupting the youth and he's essentially sentenced to death. He's given this opportunity to apologize. And instead of apologizing, he says, I, I basically serve a higher God. I serve someone else. I'm not apologizing to you, mere mortals. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but this ends up with him sentenced to death by poisoning. And what does he do? He administers the poison by himself. He poisons himself. So he lives by principle. The sigma male in him, this quality, he's got this principle, this selfishness. A bit stubborn, <clears throat> but he's also deep. He's a philosopher. He's highly intelligent. He's able to step back and view the world in a way that most people back then didn't view the world. And he's dangerous. The way he speaks, the way he talks to the youth, the way he spreads ideas very dangerous. And in the end, he chooses death over dishonor. Then we have the third one, Musashi, the samurai, Miyamoto Musashi. He is a swordsman many, many, many years ago. He's a vagrant. He's a writer. He's a philosopher. And he's Ronin. So he's Ronin during this period of time, a long time ago, when Ronin wasn't a good word to describe someone. So when I think of Ronin, I think of someone with, who serves no master, which is essentially the meaning. And when you hear that as a Sigma male, you might think, hell yeah, I serve no master. I think that's one of my affirmations. I serve no master. But in Japan, even nowadays, if you serve no master, it means that you're kind of a wild card. You don't have the honor. If you don't serve a master, you don't have the honor. You don't follow a certain code because you have no master to obey. So hundreds of years ago, a ronin wasn't necessarily considered a good thing. It's, not, it's certainly not cool like we would consider it. And even today, to be a ronin is not very revered in Japanese society, even in 2020. To have no master, to really even be your own boss, is very, has a very different meaning for us. Our values are very different. So to be a ronin during this time was to have a lot of enemies. And so he's this wandering swordsman engaging in duels. Occasionally he jumps onto a cause and he fights in a, in a real war. But then he goes back to his life of isolation. <clears throat> and he walks this path of mastery. At age 15, he leaves the house. He leaves the domicile. And he goes on this journey, just starts challenging dudes. I'll fight you. I'll battle you. Sword on sword action. And he's a little cunning too. Actually, he's very cunning. He doesn't always follow the rules. He's trickery. He uses trickery. He's crafty. And he goes on to be undefeated in 61 duels. So you don't make a lot of enemies if you lose sometimes. Undefeated people make a lot of enemies. And he wrote books and eventually he died after writing The Way of Walking Alone, which is considered to be a very powerful book about, you know, being alone, walking your own path. A lot of Sigma males like this, like this book, and there's cool videos out there about this book. 
And what really stuck out to me when I watched this documentary on Musashi was the fact that he did two things. First part, at a young age, he decides, I'm going to walk this path of mastery at all expense. I'm going to live outside. I'm going to sleep on the ground, in the forest. I'm going to go days without eating. I'm going to dedicate my life to mastering swordsmanship, battle, one-on-one -on -one fighting. And as he grows older, he loses all of his fear of earthly dangers. You don't get through 61 duels and many battles without really accepting death. <clears throat> And this was a time when death was really the ultimate end and also the ultimate beginning. They had airtight philosophies back then. So it's a little different from nowadays. Um, so he goes through his whole life basically facing his fears, facing death, the ultimate fear. And he also gets comfortable with a very massive fear for many of us in today's world and back then. It's not necessarily the fear of death that scares us. It's this fear of being disliked, of being ostracized, of being an outcast. And he conquers that by being this wandering swordsman. He's very much hated, hated and then eventually revered. And so what's the modern equivalent of a Musashi life? You're a loner, you're on your purpose, you're a hermit, you're a bit rebellious, and you just focus on your mastery. I think of someone who <clears throat> is sort of wandering the world and they're engaging in something with high degree of difficulty and mastery. Maybe someone like a, an MMA fighter or a kickboxer, but someone who's outside that limelight. There are many people in Thailand who are living a life of combat, stoic combat, and yet they're out of the limelight. They only really care about what happens in that ring. They don't care about the lights. There are no sponsorships. There's no Reebok sponsorship. There's no multi-million dollar deals. And this is much like Musashi. There were no sponsorships. There were no deals. They were just fights and mastery. So Musashi, why is he a bit of a Sigma male? Well, he's a loner. He's on his purpose. He's a hermit. He ends up dying in a very hermit life. And he's rebellious. He lives a very different life. Even though we look back on this samurai character back then with a bit of reverie, at the time he was very rebellious. He's a renegade. Many people did not like him. And finally, he was a master of his craft. Next, we have Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers. And as a founding father, he's a very outcast kind of founding father, a true outsider during this time. Many of the Founding Fathers come from different kinds of special privilege or lineage or the sort of white Anglo-Saxon Christian fundamentals, but Alexander Hamilton comes to America to this, to this limelight as an orphaned, poor Jewish person. So he's very different from the other Founding Fathers, and he climbs from nothing to be one of these most important people in the development of, of America, the fundamentals of America, were birthed from this man. What did he do? He reinvented the banking system, changed the economic system. He did all these things, these interesting things for America. And what was America during this time? America was essentially the sigma male of the world. During this time, America was this kind of MGTOW, like, we're going our own way, we're doing it our own way. So all of the Founding Fathers were very much these kind of Sigma male renegades. They might have been a little extroverted here and there, but they had these beliefs of, we're not going to climb the social ladder, we're not going to climb the social hierarchy, we're going to make our own on this strange land. So it's very interesting to think about the Founding Fathers as Sigma male. Obviously, things are very different now. America has changed, and we're going through a lot of transformation, but it's, it's cool to think about history like that. He was a fierce abolitionist. He was a fierce abolitionist against slavery, if you don't know what that means, during a time when it was very common to have slaves. He said that 
African Americans at the time were essentially equal to us in many of our physical capabilities. And this isn't like at the time when <clears throat> abolition started to become popular and people would say, well, they're not equal to us, but they, should, they shouldn't be slaves. Alexander, Alexander Hamilton thought they're actually equal to us and they shouldn't be slaves. So it was very different back then. And he made a lot of enemies for this concept. And back in those days, you just sort of lived with these enemies. You knew that these enemies were there. You knew that you were disliked. Every day you went to work with people and you had to have a thick skin because half the people you worked with, maybe half these founding fathers, he would argue with daily or people in the political spectrum. He made enemies. He had people conniving against him, scheming. Even though we view the Founding Fathers as being these men of high integrity, there were certainly games to be played. Maybe they were a little more on the surface, as you'll see in his death, but they were very much people trying to hurt you, trying to take you down. Eventually, Alexander Hamilton dies in a duel with this guy named Burr, and it was, thing, it was over things that they said to each other. And when you think about the world today, how much stuff is talked to people this day and nothing ever happens because everybody wants to be liked. You want to talk a bunch of smack to someone, but you don't actually want to back it up. And it's crazy to think that he died in this duel over something that he just said. They fought each other, but why did he do it? Why did he decide to duel this guy? Well, I think it really comes down to one thing. He attempted to be honorable. He attempted to live his life with honor. And why was he a Sigma male? What traits represented that Sigma side of him? Well, I think it was that, that honor that he tried to live by that makes him a little bit Sigma male. He was a game changer, a bit of a revolutionary, obviously. And he was an outsider, misunderstood. He was also a bit of an elitist. He thought he was special. He was a bit selfish. And he died for his self-belief, his belief within himself, and he died for his own beliefs that he had. He had true trust in his capabilities. Otherwise, why would you take a duel if you didn't trust yourself to get the job done? And I think that's very Sigma of him, to trust that he could get the job done and to do something for honor. And lastly, we have the musical genius Beethoven, composer, pianist. He's really the world's first rock star in the fact that he's a rebel. He's a musician that many people don't like, and he really shakes the system. How did he do that? Well, <clears throat> he hates the people in this time who he plays for. During this time, the aristocracy hires these musicians to play for them, but they treat them typically like you would treat a cook. He's not quite this musical genius yet. He's not a rock star. He's not a genius. So the way he's treated is a little different and he hates the royal class for this. He doesn't like them. He, he holds them in contempt and he does so in various behaviors. First, he demands to sit at the royal table. He says, I deserve to sit at the royal table. I'm not a cook. He dresses as a commoner. He decides during this time where appearance is really everything, trying to look regal is everything. And he dresses, he comes to these performances dressed as a commoner, very dirty clothes. He wouldn't play if he's not in the mood. He's very moody and he decides, I'm not playing tonight because I don't feel like it. And then he talks over other people's performances, but he demands that people are silent during his. So he's very much controversial. And yet his talent trumps all of his behavior. People know that they have to respect him because his talent is there. And yet they haven't even seen his true genius because eventually he goes into this period of depression because he discovers that he's becoming deaf and full, finally he becomes full on deaf and he enters this space where he's very depressed, going through a lot and he sequesters himself. He goes into isolation and he does this for a while. And this is where he writes symphony number no. nine and it becomes his legacy. It's where we see him become a real master who we respect for thousands of years, perhaps forever. And 
<clears throat> it's during this time of isolation where he's able to produce the most magnificent thing he's ever produced. And I think of Sigma males when I think of that story and Beethoven in general, how we can be irreverent. We can look at a system and pff, whatever, the system's stupid. I don't want to be involved in that system. And yet, Sigma males really are respected by everyone when they can have that talent, that mastery. I think about his isolation, how he was able to produce the most magnificent piece of music in his isolation. He's also creative and abstract. And he's also introverted. He prefers time alone. He's a creative genius and he wants to be alone. He goes a little crazy. People often view him as crazy. He would often be stopped by police in the city and when they would sort of bother him and he would say, do you know who I am? I'm Beethoven. And they would say, no, you're not Beethoven. Beethoven would never act like that. So he's disliked. He's regarded as this kind of freak, but he's impossible to not respect. He's impossible not to revere. So those are my examples of people that are hated, disliked, and they continue on with their day. They learn to live in the uncertainty of being disliked. And what happens from that space? How do they deal with it? Well, they deal with it just by moving on, by focusing on principles, focusing on their path of mastery. And what do we get out of that? We get some of the greatest political stuff, political evolution, musical genius, philosophical thinking, the greatest swordsman to have ever lived, a legacy that inspires many. And we get this guy who explored the world. He brought many things across many cultures, fused many things. But if they were worried about being liked, if they were worried about their enemies, we would have never received those things. So if you're thinking about being liked, or you're worried about it, or you're afraid of an enemy you have, you need to think about your own purpose and continue to walk that and focus on the truth in your heart. So thank you for watching and we will see you on the next one.